Good morning, everybody. This is a beautiful crowd today for the middle of July. Thousand degrees outside. Grateful for air conditioners that work. And for the fact that you're all here with us today. Please pray with me, if you will. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be focused on you. Amen. Amen. Our scripture today is from Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his splendor with all his angels with him, then he will take his seat on his glorious throne. All the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate men from each other like a shepherd separating sheep from goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who have won my father's blessing, take your inheritance, the kingdom reserved for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was lonely, and you made me welcome. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you came and looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to see me there. Then the true man will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? And when did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? Lord, when did we see you lonely and make you welcome or see you naked and clothe you or see you ill or in prison and go to see you? And the king will reply, I assure you, that whatever you did for the humblest of my brothers, you did for me. Now, I've preached from this passage. I don't even know how many sermons I have from this passage, standing right here in this church. And I've also used these passages when I'm having discussions, discussions with other people in other areas, especially when I'm talking to people who are complaining about all the homeless folks we have in this area or all of the immigrants we have in this area. I always talk to them about living like Matthew 25. Most of the time, though, I use this passage when I'm talking to people who say to me, you know what, I don't give money out of my window to people begging on the street because they're probably just going to use it for drugs or to get drunk. So I don't give them money. So I just whip this passage right out and say to them, uh, you know, nowhere in here do I read that you're only supposed to help people who are going to do something good with the help that you give them. Now, I know it's hard to hand your money out the window to some stranger. I get that. But I also know this is a very generous church, and you're all happy to help when the church needs money. You do. You don't even question what we're going to use it for. You just happily throw your money into that plate as it passes by you. So here's what I say. If there's any of you here who are uncomfortable giving your money out the window to somebody who is um, desperately living on the streets and begging, next time you see that dirty, ragged, thirsty, beaten down person standing on the corner, just pretend for a moment that they're holding out an offering plate instead of a sign that says, I'm hungry. Now, I want you to know, I grew up in a church where uh, the congregation got beaten down every Sunday. I feel like I'm so far away from you. Sorry, Jason. It just messes up his camera. Sorry. I, I do. I, I, I grew up in a church like that, all right? My Sunday school teacher, the preacher... The songs that we sang in choir, all of it talking to me about what a sinner I was. Making sure that I remembered that I was the wretch that received amazing grace. And a lot of Sundays, I I was just brought to my knees, just, just destroyed with guilt and with shame for who I was. And that's the kind of church I grew up in. But that church is not this church. And we know better than those things, right? 
This is not the kind of church that beats people down. So please, what I'm about to say to you, please don't take this and feel guilty or feel ashamed of anything. Because what my hope for today is, my hope for this sermon today, is that we get prepared for what's about to happen in the United States. Especially after what happened yesterday and what's going to happen in November. We have to be prepared. Then the other thing I want to say to you before I talk about anything specifically is that I want you to know that I am not comfortable being political in church. I believe that line that said there should be a separation of church and state. And so when we're in church, my focus, I want my focus to be on Jesus Christ and the risen Christ. I saw a, bull, a billboard yesterday driving, driving around in Abilene that said, uh, uh, we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I thought, well, what about Him risen? What about the rest of the story? Right? Y'all are only getting half of it. Anyway, so I want you to know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not asking to participate in a debate with you after this sermon about Republican ideals or Democratic platforms. I do not want to talk politics with you. I love you. <laughs> I want us to love each other still. All right? We're not going to talk politics. I don't need to discuss with any of you how you're going to vote or why you're going to vote or what your reasons are for going down there to vote. That's your private decision. And you make your decision and I'll make mine. And I know with all my heart that I'll be canceling out at least one of you. <laughs> but what I am incredibly comfortable at is preaching about justice. Part of my calling to lead a congregation is based on justice. I believe that last line of our Pledge of Allegiance that says, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I believe that. I had to memorize the preamble to the Constitution when I was young. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Well, we didn't have that yesterday, did we? Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare. I knew this when I was young. I'm not young anymore. I have to read it now. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. I memorized that as a teenager. And my heart swelled with pride. And don't forget, don't forget the Declaration of Independence, right? This is my very favorite one. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they, they are endowed to, by their Creator, certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I memorized those things when I was young. I memorized some other things as well, too, though. I memorized the great commandment from, from this book right here. Love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I memorized a passage in Galatians. As a matter of fact, Galatians 6, it says, to carry each other's burdens... And in this, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And in Ephesians, there's a passage that says, Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you. And then one of my favorite passages in Galatians 5.13 where it says, for you are called into freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. 
but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You should love your neighbor as yourself. I memorized all those things. They're part of, uh, when I could remember things, they're part of my memories, but now they're part of my character, part of what I try to do in my life. Now, the beginning part of Matthew 25 is about bridesmaids. You remember this story? There's ten bridesmaids. Some of them brought enough oil. Some of them didn't. The bridesmaids with enough oil sent the other bridesmaids out to buy new oil. While they were out, the bridegroom shows up. They get locked out of the party. That whole, that whole story is supposed to be a parable about being ready for when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. The thing is, is that I believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead but I don't think for one single second of time since then that we have ever been without Jesus Christ in this earth. And so while it's about being prepared for when Jesus Christ shows up in your life, I also believe that it's about being prepared for those times when Christ needs to be physically present in the lives of others. That we have to be prepared to be Jesus in the life of somebody else. Now, five years ago, I would have said to you, you know, there are times when God's not here. Times in my life where I felt the absence of the Holy Spirit, the absence of Jesus, the risen Christ in my life. But I'm going to tell you in the last five years, and especially in the last five months, I've learned if I can't feel God, it's probably because my eyes are closed. Because God is God and God is always right there. But in verse 31, Jesus says to them that whatever they do for the least of these, for these folks that are hungry and thirsty, for these folks without clothes and without shelter, for these people who are sick, and these people who are in prison, whatever he does for the least of these is just like you've done it for Jesus Christ. It's the same thing. And that's the part of Matthew, that I, Matthew 25, that I want to focus on. And folks, I, I'd written here that we're coming into a time in the United States but after yesterday, I've decided we're living in a time in the United States where divisions between neighbors will destroy people's lives. Because yesterday, the former president of the United States was wounded in an attempt on his life. But somebody died. Two people died in the middle of that. And there are two more critically ill. And things like that tear at our fiber just a little bit, right? Tear at our fiber that's already barely hanging on as a nation. And so, I, <laughs> you know me, I, I'm not a, I, I don't want to be a drama queen, all right? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to create some, some, I'm not running around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to tell you that the sky is falling. I'm not saying that to you, all right? I'm not trying to stir you up and make you panic. But what I am trying to tell you is that we've got to stop sitting comfortably in our pews and do something to bring Jesus to this world physically. Because something happened in this country between the time that we wrote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Something happened along the way and we got more focused on the pursuit of our own happiness, and we forgot about everybody else. And folks, we can't live like that anymore. We can, but it'll destroy us. We won't live long like that. And while being a Christian is about bringing other people to the knowledge of the risen Christ, it's come the, to the point in our nation and in our world where it's also about saving people from actual physical starvation and death from exposure to the element, elements or to a lack of water. 
or to not having access to health care. We have to be prepared to take care of the least of these. I want us to sit down very soon on a Sunday afternoon after church. Maybe we'll have a bologna sandwich, Linda. We're not gonna, we're not gonna have a big deal out here. Everybody bring a sack lunch, bring a pen and a pad, and we're gonna talk about getting prepared because what Matthew 25, 31 is telling us is that we've got to begin to help the people in this neighborhood who can't eat because they don't have money for groceries. And not just the people in this neighborhood. There's people in this room, folks, who don't have enough money for groceries every week. People who are having to choose between medicine and gasoline for their car. Right here among us. And we've got to be prepared to help these people. We have to make a plan for how we can provide shelter in the winter so that people don't freeze to death two blocks from here. We've got to have a strategy to open these doors to folks living in our neighborhoods with addiction issues and the folks who've been abused. I don't think God put us way off the main street accidentally. I don't think we're a whole block off Meadowbrook accidentally because you know what? Meadowbrook is dangerous. And the people walking up and down Meadowbrook who are living on that street without adequate shelter, they're in danger out there. I think we're a block off that main street because we're a safe place. And they need to be separated from the trauma and from the danger that that main street holds. Now, <clears throat> this is the part of my sermon I've worried about for about two weeks now. But I'm going to read a statement to you from a young woman who grew up in the church, and she has now, because of the trauma inflicted on her by the church and, and, and by the world, she's renounced not just the church, but also any belief that she has in God. She claims that God is dead, actually. And she writes some very harsh things. And I don't read very often what she writes because I don't also like to traumatize myself. And so, but I read this last week and I want you to know this is going to be difficult for me to read and difficult for you to hear, but this young lady is spot on when she's talking about our culture today. So this is uh, part of, a, part of a, a, a prose piece written by a young lady named Caitlin Shelter. Caitlin says this, I need you to know that I absolutely lay the dissolution of America at the feet of white Christianity. You have churches on every street corner. You don't pay taxes. You don't cure homelessness. You don't take care of the elderly. You don't foster. You don't protest injustice. You don't oppose guns or borders or exclusion. You sit in your pews and you have vacation Bible school, and you go on mission trips, and you claim Jesus is the answer. And Caitlin says Jesus is not the answer. She says your hands and feet and money and mouths are the answer. And it will be the church that dooms us all. It's hard for me to read. As a minister of the gospel, it's hard for me to read that this young woman, this creative and brilliant young woman, believes God is dead. It's hard for me. And I grieve the loss of her soul. Not that God stopped loving her, but that she has walked away from that relationship with God. It's also hard for me to read because she's very angry and she's very hurt. And it's hard for me to read finally because I've never in my life wanted more to prove somebody wrong. Now, this church is not that church that she describes. And I know that. I am literally and figuratively, figuratively preaching to the choir. I know that. 
But this church is a beacon in this neighborhood. The city, filled with lights, sitting on a hill. Oh, yes. Sometimes Siri is just so nosy. I am so sorry. I did turn my phone off, Winston, but I... Uh, apparently, Siri is always listening. I'm sorry. So Caitlin makes some great points in in uh, in what she writes there, and it, some of them just stabbed me right in the heart. And so I hope this morning, instead of being mad at me for what I said about white Christianity, because you know. That's us, for the most part. I want you to join me instead. And be these Christians that Jesus described in Matthew 25. I want you to help me take care of the forgotten in the world. Those left behind, those ostracized and marginalized and ignored. Help me to take care of the least of these. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, we are a privileged people, Lord. We have the blessing of gathering together in a comfortable, safe space with electricity and running water and air conditioning and heat when we need it and food in the pantry and money in the bank. And God, so help us, help us to be better stewards and use what you give us, Lord, not for our own comfort, but God, for those people in this world who are living in discomfort. And God, for the things that happened in this country yesterday, Lord, for another senseless act of violence using a gun, a 20-year-old with a gun, God, I don't, I don't even know what it will take. I don't know what we need for us to stop and do something. But Lord, whatever it is, I call on you now in the name of the risen Christ to make us your hands and your feet, to make us your mouth, to use our money, Lord, and our talents and our time to take care of the least of these. And we pray these things in your name because you told us you're always listening to us. Amen.